Hello and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. This is episode 170, Controversial Truths About Music Ed with Angela Ammerman. This week, I connect with yet another instrumental music educator. Don't worry, I will be fine. It was a great pleasure, actually, to speak with Dr. Angela Ammerman this week about many music education topics that she's passionate about, including some controversial truths that I found on her Instagram account, The Music Teacher's Guide. We discussed the ideas that the best music teacher doesn't necessarily need to be the best musician. Oftentimes, we should be trying to facilitate our students' skills surpassing even our own. We also discussed the contradiction in the arts education communities that, on one hand, presents itself as liberal and supporting of freedom of expression, while on the other hand, displays sometimes a culture of, I would call, toxic conformity and intolerance towards diverse ideas and viewpoints. Angela shares her experiences as a tenure-track professor who left academia to be a stay-at-home mom, as well as clinician, consultant, and host of the Music Ed Love podcast, the hashtag Music Ed Love podcast. So tune in, and as always, chime in with your thoughts on the Facebook page at Choralosophers, the Patreon page, and of course now there's a new Substack. It's a free newsletter that has its own chat feature that we can all use to stay in touch on all these topics. Now, of course, you will also be able to find this episode on Angela's podcast, hashtag Music Ed Love. We're going to cross-post this. So enjoy. I think you will find this conversation refreshing and as always, wide-ranging. I'm excited to tell you about Ludus.com, a new platform designed for the performing arts by people from the arts. With Ludus, you'll have access to a friendly, knowledgeable, customer success team that's available when you need them. And the best part? There are no setup costs, contracts, or hidden fees. It's 100% free to your program, so why not give it a try and see how Ludus can help you streamline your operations and put the focus back on your passion for the arts. Coralosophy listeners can go to ludus.com forward slash Coralosophy for an upgrade for free to their marketing suite. Did you know that listening to this show is like a golden ticket for discounts? You can get discounts when you sign up you and your students at sightreadingfactory.com and you can plug that code in every year to keep that 10% discount going and support the show all at the same time. You can do the same thing at mymusicfolders.com every time you order the best choir folders on the market. You can do that at graphite publishing and endeavormusicpublishing.com when you order some of the best online printable sheet music in the industry. All of these websites will allow you to enter Coralosophy at checkout to get a discount. So make sure you do yourself and the show a favor by remembering to do that every time. If you are a Coralosophy listener who finds value in this content, in the resources, and just in the conversation, you might consider supporting at Patreon. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy and sign up to support the underlying costs of this show. It is a huge deal for me when you do that, and it shows your thanks, but it also helps me continue to do this. The show is produced on Patreon by Venture Studios, Ryan Main, Michael Heron, Kyle Peterson, Stephen Kathy Kakachik, David Kowalsik, Max Jackson, Ulrika Igrain Munoz Alarcon, John Warner, Angie Schilling, Nathan Hines, Jared Hendricks, Brian Long, and Jonah Clicksbull. All right, everybody, I am here with Angela Ammerman. Angela is an instrumental music educator, uh, specifically in the orchestra area. And for those of my my listeners on the on the Coralosophy feed, um, this is the second instrumental educator in not very long. Stephen Cox was on the show recently, uh, but don't worry, uh, we're just expanding our vocabulary as music educators here on the Coralosophy podcast. So, Angela, welcome. Thank you, Chris. It is so awesome to finally actually talk to you and see you and to have you at the same time on hashtag music ed love. This is so, so cool. And I have to tell you, I love choral music ed. Um, I sang in choirs for a long time. And even, you know, um, while I was teaching orchestra, I was singing with like the Alexandria Choral Society and absolutely loved it. And I feel like I learned so much watching choral rehearsals for what we do in orchestra. So it's so cool to see what you're doing on social media and with your podcast and to get to do this like super special episode. I'm so excited. And everyone, this is Chris Munz, by the way. I didn't even say that. I know his listeners know that. And my listeners, hopefully you know that as well. But if not, make sure you check out his podcast, The Choralosophy Podcast. And hopefully you'll really love this special joint episode we have. 
Yeah, we're doing a little bit of a podcast exchange here, so uh, this episode will appear on both feeds, and I'm excited to have some conversations that I think both of our audiences will find interesting and hopefully helpful. Uh, so what, before we get too far into that, though, why don't you tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do as kind of your day job? Uh, what do you, how do you fill your days with music? Sure. Well, right before we started recording, we actually had to stop because I have a three-year-old here at home. And my primary job right now is a stay-at-home mom to this three-year-old child that I have. And um, so I, I had to run up because he, of course, woke up from his, you know, from bedtime as soon as we started recording. And um, being a stay-at-home mom has given me so much joy. I can't even tell you, like, I've always wanted to do that. Um, and I'm extremely grateful because my husband works from home on Fridays. So on Fridays, I get to work one day uh, at George Mason University, where I teach music education. And then I also teach early childhood education um, one day a week with my son, where I teach uh, zero to three-year-olds right now. And we do like songs and dance and instruments and it is so much fun and it's not teaching orchestra which I you know definitely miss but that's still where like my background is very much in teaching orchestra and um so it's been really cool to to get to apply what I'm teaching to my own students to these little kids that I'm that I'm learning every single week while I'm doing that so I have a really weird setup right now it's really weird and then I do conferences and like I conduct all state orchestras I was at three last year and um I'm getting ready to do Utah's this year and um, I never dreamt that this would be my life, that I would be like, I'm a stay at home mom. And people are like, come conduct all state. But, you know, you just never know what path your life is going to take. So that's where I am. It's kind of crazy. That's awesome. Yeah. That's How about cool. you, Chris? Tell us where are you? What do you do? Yeah, it's so cool. I love it. I'm that's very cool. So I, um, I I am a choir director that wears multiple choir director related hats. I'm very fortunate to be employed um, in a lot of kind of different types of scenarios where they're all choir related. So I, I always tell my students at school, I have uh, four jobs, but they're all choir related. And so that means that I get to kind of think of them as one job. So my main, uh, in, in order of time consumingness, my jobs are teaching choir at 9 through 12 at Lee Summit High School, and that's outside of the Kansas City area. And that's a large choral program in the suburbs of Kansas City, and I've been there for 19 years. This is not the, my 19th year at that school. Um, and then, of course, my next most time-consuming job is the Choralosophy Choral Podcast. I publish episodes once a week, um, all year long, and uh, have been doing that now for almost five years. February 2024 will be my five-year uh, show anniversary. And then let's see what else. Oh, I also uh, run a nonprofit arts organization in Kansas City called Contra IKC and direct music at a church about three minutes from my house. And so all of those things together uh, is a lot. And I also have kids. I'm My oldest is 15 and is a freshman in my choir program. And my youngest is uh, in sixth grade and is a choir and band student at the middle school that um, here in town as well. So it's a it's a busy life, but I love it. That is so cool. Like, how do you love having your own kid in your program? That must be that must be so interesting in a million ways, right? It is, and and it was interesting because we weren't sure that we wanted to do that. Uh, in, other, in other words, she is a transfer student. We had to transfer her to my school in order to be in the program. And so if you, you're just to go based on the public school zip code, you know, where she should go, she should be at a different high school. And we were kind of on the fence until the last minute about whether or not we wanted to bring her to our school. And And I'm really glad that we did. Of course, I had all of the doubts like, will I be too hard on her or will I be not hard enough? Um, on her because she's my kid in the class and uh, it ends up I'm just have been really glad so far we're only a few months into it uh, but she's loving being in my choir class and I'm, I'm also loving having um, her teachers like right down the hall for me when something is when she needs help and advocate in her other classes I can just walk down the hall and talk to her science teacher or talk to her math teacher uh, which has been really great. Oh, that is the dream. I really love that. Like, I thought so much about eventually going back into the classroom and teaching orchestra again, K-12 orchestra, 
And you know, the main reason is so that I could have my son. Okay, this isn't totally true, but it's a huge reason so that I could, my, could have my own son in my class someday. Uh-huh. I feel like that would be so much fun. Uh, as long as, you know, we don't have that teenage strife that sometimes occurs, but hopefully, you know, we'll be good. Well, I wish I could tell you that there's a way to avoid the teenage strife as a parent. Uh, it it doesn't go, like there's just no, I don't think there's a magic button to make that go away. But I will say, I don't know, my wife and I have mixed feelings, or also have kind of different opinions, I guess would be a better way to say it. Um, she misses the baby days, and I do not miss the baby days at all. Like I, I, I'm, I'm having more fun being a dad as they get older. Um, and maybe that's just a personality difference. I like having... The, like the real conversations that you can't have with a baby, you know? So, but, you know, Beth misses the smell and the cuddling and the, you know, all of that. And that's, that's hard. It is. It is. Well, and they, you know, I know this is cliche, but seriously, you all, they grow up so fast and like, he's our first one. And so people would always say that to me and now I'm experiencing it for myself. And it's kind of shocking how quickly time has passed since having a child. Um, but I, I can definitely see how you would, you know, really enjoy as you watch them kind of grow into their, I don't know, their little mini adult selves, um, seeing where they're going and and having a very unique relationship with them, which is, it's just really cool. I'm sure that that's, uh, very exciting to see as they continue to grow. Yeah, that's great. Super cool. Well, I, I want to, uh, jump in here with some meat if we can, because I, uh, I came across your Instagram. That's how I knew know of you, um, and uh, I'm always interested in music educators. It always I always perk up when I scroll across a music educator who is willing to kind of put out some philosophies about what they do because it's well. Let me just put it this way: I mentioned that I was five years into podcasting. Five years ago, when I started doing this, there really weren't very many of us online. And in other words, there were not very many of us com- trying to communicate to a broader public about what music education is, and and definitely not very many folks that were willing to say, "Here's my philosophy. Here's how I think we should teach. Here's you know, um, here is here are professional development ideas that can help you teach." It, I think we we came out of a at least in my generation as an educator uh, that if if someone doesn't invite you to talk about those things at a convention, then you just need to stop talking about it. Like it's it we don't need your opinion, um, you know that that kind of a thing. And I actually saw that as very unhealthy five or six years ago about the way our our music education profession was going. And so I started diving in, put throwing my hat into the ring. And of course, now I'm going around the country all the time as a clinician and as a consultant and all of these types of things. And people are asking my opinion, but I had to like put myself out there in order to get to that point. And so I'm interested in just your thoughts generally on on that change in the landscape over the last five or six years and, and what you think about that. You know, it's funny because I, uh, the Music Ed Love podcast started in a very different way, but I think with a very similar goal mm-hmm. in a really, really weird way. So I was teaching in this really, really small town in Tennessee, and my students had extremely limited access to uh, resources. I mean, we were like three, well, you know, you know, you're in Kansas, so you know how rural some of these, these places can be, right? Mm-hmm. I know you're in Kansas City, but like, Um, They just had such limited access. And um, I found it really frustrating for professional development for these music ed students that like there was like one big event, their conference a year. And that was, you know, cost prohibitive for a lot of my students. So I started the podcast initially um, as a way to bring in these really great music educators that I respected and that I felt like had a similar philosophy of teaching so that I could kind of be like, okay, it's not just me. Look at the other people. And, and, you know, it was kind of sad that I felt like I had to do that, but honestly, I felt like I was at a place where my students wanted to do things exactly the way their band director did. And most of my students at that time were banned, by the way, almost all of them. And so I was coming in as this like orchestra person teaching all these band kids how to teach music. And um, I felt like I had to bolster my own, you know, my own philosophy and what I really wanted them to, um, to kind of see that maybe they had never seen before, but it was incredible. We were bringing in all of these speakers that um, I just really loved. And I learned so much from them at the beginning. And that was amazing, but it also developed in me like this confidence to then share my own philosophies and my own beliefs on teaching music that I, I don't know that I would have had the confidence to do 
previous to then. And like, I'm not sure that the landscape currently is such that a beginning teacher can come out and share exactly how they think things should be done. For example, when I'm teaching, I, (laughs) uh, it's chaos. It is, it is controlled chaos. I'll say it's controlled for the most part, but I have like three to five different groups doing different things at the same time. And you'd walk in the room and think, what is happening? And my students are like singing random lyrics to random songs and they're they're up doing dance moves to music. And so when you look in, it looks like it's madness. And then when you actually sit down and observe a rehearsal, you start to see the, the genius behind the madness, not the genius, but the brilliance, right? That's there. Um, and I feel like when I used to do that, same exact thing like 10 years ago, people thought I was crazy. In fact, there was one woman who treated me so, so badly. She still to this day talks about me horribly. She's like super high up in, in orchestra world too. And I've had multiple people tell me like, oh, she hates you. She thinks your your teaching um, pedagogy is like totally off. She thinks your methodology is totally off. And so I, I, I feel like, I don't know that that's changed so much as maybe we have kind of been able to do more and been able to be more open about that and then hopefully give a platform for others though in that way i don't know i mean what is your experience been yeah no i those are all that's a really great story because i i have some parallels too and and one of the things that i've discovered is that uh i have those same types of people in my life that like the person you just talked about who kind of maybe talks behind your back or talks about you in, in a negative way. I have those people as well, but I did before I started the podcast. So I had to, um, you know, I had to just decide that I'm going to put stuff out there and not really care about those people. Um, because, um, there, it, I kind of, I think I learned this from, I cut my teeth in this way, directing church music, because there is nothing more, uh, sometimes can be nothing more toxic than a, a den of old church ladies. Um, and because they will complain about everything. But what I learned early on um, is that I, if, let's say if I'm picking songs, some of them will love the songs and some of them will hate the songs. But then if I tr- pick different songs to please the group of ladies that hated the songs, then the other group of ladies that love the other songs is now mad. And then, so I, I can't please everybody. And so my philosophy has been, I'm going to talk about the music education topics and philosophical topics and um, maybe even social justice topics or whatever it is that I'm passionate about and I think are interesting. And some people will then come across my feed and my Instagram and my TikTok and whatever it is, and they might want to join that conversation. And then some people will be like, I don't like that stuff. And I'm going to, and that's fine. Like I'd ha- I have to decide that I'm not going to attract every single music educator. But what I do believe in is that the one, I guess the one thing I can't stomach is a music education landscape where these types of conversations just aren't happening in public. Um, I didn't think it was quite healthy that they were only happening by invite only at conventions for the for the teachers who could afford to go to the convention or or whatever. And so in the the, the audi- audience that I've cultivated here, um, I do have a lot of folks that do also go to conventions, but I also have a lot of teachers that listen in all all over the world who can't go to conventions, and and this is their PD, um, and so that that means a lot to me too. That matters as well. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Well, and I love that you're really giving a voice to these topics that have been kind of like shushed for a while too. Um, because I find that that social pressure to conform as much as we as artists say we want this freedom and this openness, there is great pressure to conform. And I've, I've felt it myself, I don't know how many times. And I know, you know, when I, when I announced to colleagues that I was going to become a stay-at-home mom, I was leaving this tenure track job, right, to become a stay-at-home mom. And this one colleague said to me, she was like, that is the most anti-feminist thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And I said... How am I? Okay, first, what is feminism? Second, how am I anti feminine by choosing to be a full time mom? Like, I'm sorry, I don't even I don't even know who you are. But this is my personal, this is my path. And I know what I'm doing. And I know I still have a calling for this other work for teaching music. And obviously, I do because I'm still writing books, and I'm still presenting and I'm still, I'm still teaching in some capacity. But, you know, I felt so strongly called as well to to stay home with my son to be with him as much as possible and i got so much flack for that it was shocking but then you know along with that flack that you get sometimes from 
going your own path, from doing what you feel is right for you, for your family. Even like for my music ed students, I felt like this was a really powerful moment to say, I know everybody else is taking this path, but it's not right for me. Like I know my path. And so for me to be bold and brave and do that, um, for my you know young students, I think that that was also really good. And some of them even told me, they were like, it was so nice to see like somebody in higher ed that was choosing family. And um, in that way, and I know we are not all able to do that, right? Like I know financially that's not always possible. So I recognize that, but um, it was just really sad that after that, I was almost like afraid to talk about that. And we have the same thing in music ed in so many ways. We, the most creative field that wants to um, develop this, you know, really powerful body of empathetic human being lovers of one another that we are so judgmental of each other and so it's been really cool to see like that you as well are are just you're paving that path chris and and it needs to be paved um it does if we are to continue to grow in many directions not just in one it is absolutely necessary if your school or church are in the market for staging products like risers, shelves, podiums, movable platforms, all of the things that you need to set your choir up for success, I would like to strongly urge you to check out StageRite. StageRite's products are sturdy, they're durable, they're easy to use. I have personal experience with the acoustical shells and some of the platforms that they have at StageRite, and I can tell you, compared to some of the more expensive competitors, they are a really great option to fit inside of a tight school budget, but also to give you the durability and usability that you need. So check out StageRight at StageRight.com. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think the um, the type of person who would respond to you in that way, which is the, almost like you're letting the team down, the uh, like team woman, uh, you're letting us down by not taking the tenure track job because, and, I, and I'm thinking in the, it, to put myself in that person's shoes, they're probably thinking something like, okay, so women have struggled for generations to get more of those types of jobs. And here you are, with the opportunity to have one of those jobs and they see it almost as a, a, a knock against their team uh, in some kind of a way rather than seeing you uh, you as an individual that is doing what's best for you um, in, a, in a way that that you might think about your obligations to your son and to your family that may, might outweigh um, your obligations to team woman of orchestra directors or you know, whatever. Um, and I think that is a, uh, that's, that's not just a music ed problem though. Like that's a broader societal problem where we aren't just able to let each other live our lives. Sometimes there's the act, the type of activism that says, um, I, I'm going to be active so that I can, that I can liberate myself and that you can liberate yourself to live the life that you were meant to live. But then there's a different kind of activism that says, uh, I need you to live the way I think you should live. Um, and th that you, I found that that comes from all corners of so society. I knew that I grew I grew up in Kansas in the '80s and '90s when that message was coming from the evangelical Christian, like right wing conservative types. And then nowadays we have that message coming from the left, from the right, from you know from the center everywhere. Uh, and you know I just have always been the, more of a live and let live kind of a person, where you don't don't hurt me, don't hurt your neighbors, um, and but live live the life that is authentically you. And I, I've always felt that it's very important for for my own work life balance to feel like I can be my authentic self, and I would never want to begrudge someone else that. Thoughts? Oh my gosh, yeah, for sure. And I I I think that um, that pressure we're we're receiving from all over. Um, our students are receiving that as well in all capacities. So when you choose to really do what's right for you, your students are taking note of that. And, and I think that as an educator of human beings, period, it is so important that we set that example. On one of your podcast episodes, you talked about like something about being silly, right? And like mm. how if we are expecting our students to come out of their shell and like really engage with us in this somewhat, you know, um, uncomfortable way at times, right? Or this like closer relationship way, we have to model that first. And I think that the same goes for kind of stepping outside of the mold of the political landscape, whatever that is in your area, or the social, you know, requirements, that is the only way we can continue to grow, we can continue to progress, if we can be bold and brave and and pave that path forward. Um, yeah. And I think that we have to do that every way, right? Like we are 
are modeling who we want. We hope our students want some part of who we are, right? We hope they take all the good things and they're like, let me take this. And um, if we don't model that, then what, what do we do? Yeah. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And, and I, I think I always tell um, young teachers, and if I have a chance to talk about this issue on the podcast, I share it as well. But uh, this idea that you just brought up of uh, being our being yourself also in the classroom, uh, I think for me as a young teacher, that was probably my biggest hurdle uh, of getting over that hurdle of being able to just be a be be the real me in front of my students. And I think once I figured out how to do that, then everything about my teaching career got became more successful. And I would say for me, that was probably year, year five, six, seven, eight is when that, that transition really started to happen for me. When I first started at the school that I currently teach at, I had just graduated with my master's in conducting at that point, and I took this job. And I was very much in the mindset of, I am going to impress these students with this amazing conducting skill that I have recently uh, obtained and they're going to they're going to love me in class because I'm so good at conducting. And of course that's just so stupid. High school kids don't give a shit. Like they they don't care what the conducting gesture looks like. They care about do I care about them? Um, am I occasionally funny? Do we they do care th- about sounding good, for sure. Like they ki- the kids really do want to sound good, but they don't really know what that is anyway at first. And so they have to learn all those things and I think part one, when I, once I figured out that um, I think it was that was a big turning point. Um, and actually, if it's okay, I, I, I think that's that might even be a really good segue to one of the memes that I brought up because uh, one of the very I think the very first thing that attracted m- my attention to your Instagram uh, was you posted a series of uh, little kind of Instagram posts or memes. Um, I'll just call them memes for lack of a better word um, that work they were listed as controversial truths. And, um, and so that, that of course always per- perks my interest cause that's what I do here. Um, but, uh, let me read one and then I want you to comment on kind of what your, what headspace you were in when you, when you made this post. So the first one was controversial truth. It's not the best musicians who make the best teachers. It's the bridge builders and the friendship seekers and the let me show you hows who happen to be good enough musicians who will become the best music teachers. Say more about that. Okay. In higher ed, we have this ongoing debate, as I'm sure you've heard. Everybody's heard. I'm sure every every one of you listening has heard this. Are we looking, are we recruiting the best musicians to become music educators? Or, or are we recruiting the best future music teachers? And there is often a difference. I'm not saying that you can't be an amazing performer and become a great teacher or that or that you're both. That's not the case. However, I've seen so many kids that don't make Allstate that don't end up even attempting to go into music ed because they don't make Allstate and they think they're not good enough, or they don't make regional orchestra and they think they're not good enough, or they don't make, you know, um, their local like district orchestra and they think I'm not good enough. And um, this perception Um, it is not entirely wrong because there are so many institutions where if you don't play at a certain level, you cannot make it in. And many of those institutions, it is, uh, it is extremely limiting for our music ed program. So what we're doing is we're, we're recruiting all these kids that have spent hours and hours and hours in practice rooms. So they're really good at their craft, but all of those hours they've spent in the practice room by themselves playing the violin, those are hours they weren't being social. And so all the kids that were there tutoring other kids were missing out on them because they weren't practicing individually. They were actually helping other kids. And, you know, in our field, um, we are desperate for teachers. We are desperate for music teachers. And, you know, in orchestra, I get phone calls at least twice a month from principals who have money for string programs. And, you know, string programs get cut so easily, so quickly from these different schools. Many schools, like in Tennessee, most of the schools don't even have a string program. So I have administrators who are like, I want an orchestra director. I have a full-time position. I have a room. I have resources. And we cannot fill these positions fast enough. You know why? Because the kids aren't going into music ed. You know why? Because they think they're not good enough. And even my own music ed students, they'll say to me, what do I do if my kids are better than me? I'm like, awesome. Let them be better than you. You have so much to give still. 
they can be better at you at 25 things and there's still more for them to learn from you. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one thing is like young teacher me did not realize like I spent my whole entire first year teaching orchestra without my instrument. Chris, I never once modeled on my violin my first year of teaching because I thought I wasn't good enough. And like this, this um, thought is so pervasive, uh, especially in the string world. And I'm sure you see it in the choral world as well. But uh, I really wanted to encourage anybody that's got kids that are like, they've got it. They're the let me take you with you kids, right? They're the kids always in your room who are always doing everything you do. Maybe they're not the best players. Maybe they're not the best singers, but they are so dedicated to the craft. Um, and those are the kids that I see becoming teachers. I want the kinds of people who are going to motivate thousands, not be able to motivate the one kid who's already motivated. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. So um, I agree with almost all of that. But my, my, my disagreement is really just maybe even semantics. And so I want to dig into that a little bit. So for example, I agree that with all the, the wholeheartedly with the whole part about how um, some people who are, so especially young singers and players and at the high school level, for example, who are thinking about becoming music educators, oftentimes are deterred by the idea that they're not good enough at something, whether it be singing or playing. I, although I've come across a lot of kids who think about music education, and I have a lot of former students who are currently teaching um, a lot, and because I've been, you know, I'm old. Um, but um, I've, I've had many conversations with kids where they will say, well, but Mr. Muntz, I, I, I don't know if I can be like you. And then I have to have the conversation where it's like, yeah, but that's not what your your future students don't need another me. They need you at your absolute best. And and so what you're going to figure out over the course of your your time growing as a teacher, if you choose to pursue this this profession, is you're going to figure out what the best you version of you as a teacher is. The reason you think I'm so great is because I'm good at what I do because I figured out how to do it like me. And 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 you're going to have to do that too, and, I, and that usually helps them to kind of think about it because they picture themselves like if they're going to be a future choir director, then they have to figure out how to be just like Mr. Muntz. And I'm like, no, no, that's not. Then you're missing the point that that you're going to. That's going to be a struggle for you. You will never be successful trying to be me, <laughs> right? And so that's that's super important. Now here's my tiny little disagreement, though. I I hear I see stuff like that, like your post, and I sometimes worry. Um, that when teachers th kind of get that idea into their head, that they then we lose the importance of, of of our students seeing us striving to be better musicians. In other words, I I do want to be like the best musician in the room for the most part, but I also want to teach with enough humility to have my kids like have my kids see me struggle with the music. In other words, I'm not going to pretend to be better than I am. Um, I famously have talked on this show quite a bit about how I'm better with pitch than rhythm. That's my my musical skill. I have good a good ear for pitch, for intonation, for chords, but my complex rhythm reading is not one of my strengths. And so the kids know that. My colleagues know that. Um, if it's a real tricky rhythm, sometimes they now will tell me to get out of the way and let the drummers do it. Um, and, and it doesn't mean that I'm not good. It just means that I know what I'm like, what my really big strengths are. And the reason I think that's important is because they're also though, going to see me working really hard to be very good at those rhythms. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. I think that's huge. I think as, as educators and mentors of our students, we absolutely have to, we have to constantly be be striving for the best in all the aspects of what we do, right? So we do, we want to be the best educators. We want to be the best mentors. We want to be the best musicians constantly. Um, but what I, what I do worry about sometimes is that the, I want the focus to be there, you know, because sometimes we are so obsessed with the actual performance that some of the other stuff kind of falls away. Like I think about some of my I shouldn't say too much, but some sometimes you graduate and you're like, I'm just going to be a band director. And they envision themselves as like, you know, the president's own director. And they're in, the, in their mind, they are conductor. And you talked about this a little bit with your own journey. It sounds like when we're a conductor instead of educator or we're performer instead of educator, that mindset is dangerous. And I love the idea of like conductor educator or performer educator, or, you know, I love that idea of pairing them. And of course we want to be the best at at all of the things, 
but I think we have to have our pri- priorities, you know, kind of set up in the right in the right order. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, uh, one another way I could think about this one would be to to instill an ethos in the ensemble that you lead. Uh, if you lead an ensemble, if, or if you know in your classroom, if you're general music or or whatever it is, but um, that that we're gonna we're gonna become good musicians. That's the ethos. It does, uh, and that's a process that never ends. And, and so, if we kind of have that as the, being the goal, uh, because what I see is a lot of times kids, and I think also young adults who are trying to become musicians, is I see people who want to be good musicians. Not, but don't want to become good musicians, and there's a huge difference. In other words, they want the finish line, but, but they don't want to do the process. Oh uh, yes, yeah, go ahead. It's everywhere. Yes, no. Oh my gosh. Yeah, sorry. Uh, this drives me nuts. No, you're right. I mean, it is so in 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 our society of instant gratification. They do often think, well, why can't I just do it? Why can't I just do it now? And and the building up of consistency and persistence and grit, that is so much of what we are made of, right? And mm-hmm. I, I think that that message, absolutely, we have to continue to convey that very strongly for our students. And that's part of what makes music educators so special is that that process, it looks different in our programs than in many other places. And um, so it's so it's so good for those kids to kind of have that little churning of all of the different elements of what we're doing. And turn into greater discipline for all aspects of their life. Yeah. Yeah. I I have that conversation with high school kids a lot when they're crying on the couch in my office because they didn't make it to something they try out for. And, and it always, the conversation almost always goes the same way, which will be like, Oh, I wanted to be in all state so bad, or I wanted to be in the top choir at the school so bad, or I wanted to just get an A on my singing test so badly or whatever. And then I almost always respond in the same way. Well, how frequently are you practicing? And the answer is almost always never. And so then, so then I will say, well, then, you know, because my kids know that I'm a real talk kind of straight shooting kind of a teacher. I'm not going to hold their hand through some of those things because I think they're big kids and they can handle it. And I'll say, well, then really you don't want those things because if you're not willing to do the practice for it, and also I'll usually ask them, I'll say, um, well, what do you do instead of practicing? So how do you spend your time? I'm playing Minecraft or I'm on TikTok or whatever. And and then I'll say, well, then that's what you want to do because you're, you're doing, you're doing what you want to do. And so if you want a different result from the next audition that you do, it's going to have to involve some practice, but here's the kicker. They, they see, they see me demonstrate that I also practice. Um, and, and that, and that has to be like, until they decide that they want to actually practice, um, then they're not going to achieve some of those, those things. And I think that's really, if, if I could get a message across to music educators, especially the young ones, it, it's exactly like you said, Angela, it's not that you have to be the best musician to be a good music teacher, but I think you have to be really good at demonstrating how to become one in order to, in order to be a good music educator. Thoughts? Oh, absolutely. But I, I have a question. Yeah. So when you have a conversation with the students, the Minecraft kid, right? <laughs> yeah. The next year, do they do the thing? Do they practice more? Or like, how often do you see that? Do they want it enough to kind of shift their priorities? I'm just kind of curious in your experience how that works for the majority. It just depends on the kid. It depends on the kid. Some, Many of them do. Many of them ha- take those types of rejections as being motivation to do better next year. Um, and some of them though, of course, give up, but the way, the way I think of it is that, you know, cause I also coach my son's baseball team. The same thing happens there. This is not a music thing. This is a life thing. And, and so, uh, you know, I have the same conversation with my son who says that he wants to play college baseball someday. And I say, okay, so how much time did you spend outside on, in the back on all that like swing training equipment that I paid for, for you? Uh, well, I haven't done it. I haven't done it all week. Okay then you're not, then you don't want to be a college baseball player. <laughs> once you decide, once you want to go outside and practice, then you will start to have the, to genuinely be able to say that you want those things. Um, and so it's, it's, I think I see my job less as making sure that every single one of my students becomes a great musician, uh, especially at the high school level. That's not my job. My job is to, uh, to teach them how to do, become a great musician if they want to be um, and show them the path to, you know, to, to show them where the water is, but I can't lead the horse to water. I just have to show them where the river is. 
um, and, and give them the tools, try to break down the barriers for them and support them and cheerlead them, but I can't do it for them. And, and that's, uh, I think that's even as, as important as the musical skills that we teach. I, I agree so much. I mean, I see this with my son too, who's, he's like a little three-year-old vi Suzuki violinist, you know, and he wants to be really good, but like the practice thing it is, it can be such an ordeal. Like, uh, yeah, you, you know, you can imagine it. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I definitely mm -hmm. feel all of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> a, it is in it. Yeah. With your own kids, it's, it's harder in a lot of ways because, <laughs> Um, you're not, you're not going to be able to emotionally detach and go home after, after that conversation. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, yeah. So just warning you that, that gets, that gets trickier. Um, so, okay. So I'm going to go back to your Instagram feed now, cause you have a sequel to that one. It was controversial truth. Number two, you're laughing. Cause you see, I do my homework for these. Um, I know you've been great. <laughs> your students just might be better musicians than you. They may be faster, stronger, wiser, more accurate, or even more musical than you. And that's actually the goal. You don't have to be the best musician in the room to be the best teacher. You simply have to be the best. Uh, yes, you've got it. Have you considered trying it this way? I've got you champion advocate coach. So this is actually is great because this is very much how our conversation had just gone as we got we kind of got into that nuance of, uh, for example, I, I'll tell a story and then I, I want to see if you have any of these types of stories. Um, but uh, as we've established, I'm old. So um, <laughs> so I had a student once, um, a choir student who did not take choir at all until junior year of high school. She was actually an orchestra kid. She was a cellist and the kids drug her out of the orchestra room into the choir room as a like going into her junior year. Um, and this kid had the most advanced sense of musical pitch and perfect pitch, uh, to the point where it was like clearly absolutely perfect pitch, unflappable um, like she, I'll kind of describe that here in a second, but they basically, the kids brought her to me because they, they, it was essentially, oh, look what she can do kind of a thing. And then you should get her to be in choir. And so essentially she could do things like, um, I, I could just smash a bunch of notes on the piano, like bum, 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 bum. And then she could just name all of them that were under my fingers, like just instantly. And there was one where I just took my whole forearm and I just rolled it down the keyboard down to the bottom end, uh, towards the end. And, uh, and she had to stop and think for a second. And, but then she named all the pitches that were under my arm. And, and then she goes, she goes, oh, I'm sorry, that last one took me a little, a little too long because when the, when the notes are at the bottom of the keyboard, the overtones just really fight with each other. And I was having trouble figuring out, and, and I've, I'm the whole time I'm going like, get thee behind me, Satan. Like, what is, what is going on here? And so, of course, yes, I, I got her to be in choir, and she decided to sign up for choir the next year, put her in an advanced group. And, and so I had this two-year span where I was intimidated to walk into that choir room because I knew that, she, that the best musician in the room was no longer me. And, of course, I'm defining best musician as in a certain sense. Like, in a certain sense, like, she, she was going to be aware of every little note that I demonstrated that was out of tune. She was going to know exactly how many cents I was out of tune <laughs> and she was going to, and I, and so I'm always worried, like uh, if I demonstrate something a little bit, I'm going to have to look at him at the corner of my eye and check out her to see if she's scowling at me or, <laughs> or like whatever. And it was a, it was a great experience for me because I had to be, um, I had to find room for that in my classroom. And so by the time we got a few months into it, I'd established a better relationship with her. She became our human pitch pipe. Rather than demonstrating a pitch, I would just point at her and say, "Hey, could you give us an F sharp?" And she would just boop it out, and like it was no, like it was no problem. And we just made this made it a thing where she, because of her special skills, she had this job, and then other kids start to have their own special skills and their special job, and and that it, intimidation eventually faded. But so that's one of the things when I saw this post, I that was immediately what I thought of was sometimes the, the musician, it, the, you might not be the best musician in the room and you have the choice to, to let that intimidate you or to strengthen your ensemble, which ultimately should be the goal. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I feel like I learned this lesson from my own mistakes, honestly. And um, your story is so funny because 
I know most of you cannot see my face, but I'm just laughing while he's telling this story because it's so relatable. You get this like hotshot kid in your program and you're like, oh no, now I have to be so on, right? And so it's so funny that you were sitting there talking about all of the different like things going through your head as you're, as she's right in front of you, like, oh, I'm going to be just a few cents off. And I, um, I relate to that so much. My, my, my first year teaching orchestra, um, I, so I had come from a conservatory background as you have as well. And I remember as a, um, when I was at my university, these, these violin majors would argue about whether it's like 440 or 439, you know, and they'd sit there and then they'd make fun of each other after they'd leave. He thought that was 440. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I, I left, um, I left CCM, to be honest with you, uh, I did not love playing anymore. Like I just didn't, I, I didn't love playing violin. Um, and I had a ton of insecurity about myself and not about teaching. I, I knew I was a great teacher. Like I did. I love teaching, but about my own, you know, playing ability because, um, a lot of my, my colleagues in college would practice literally like at two in the morning, you'd walk in and they would have fallen asleep and there'd be another person sleeping under the piano, you know, in the practice room. And, um, you, the practicing intensity was so great. And I really felt really insecure. So my first year, as I said, I didn't play at all. And I did have some students that I really felt like were better than me. And I, it is the biggest regret of my entire career because I feel like I had so many opportunities, I had so many missed opportunities, you know? And um, after that first year, I kind of got over my own self and I started playing and, and I started realizing that like, I'm totally going to mistake, make mistakes. And when I do, that's going to be good for my hotshot kids actually, because here I am taking risks in front of them and they're seeing me make a mistake. So if I do that, then they are more likely to take those risks, those musical risks that I'm going to be asking them to do and that they're going to be asked to do their whole career, their whole lives. Right. And if, if I do that with, you know, a levity, then they're going to be able to do the same thing. And so um, once I kind of realized that, that just helped me a lot. And then also teaching my students, you know, these future music teachers, that's a question that comes up almost every single year is, what do I do if there's a kid that plays better than me? I'm like, yes, let's go. You know, that's awesome. You continue to coach them. Like you think about all these great football coaches, you know, they're not as good players as they're as their players. They're a great coach. It's a different skill set. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Um, it, it's an interesting phenomenon because in a lot of ways we become better teachers um, by figuring out a large, a, like a, a bigger repertoire of our own set of tools for empowering those hotshot kids, but also empowering the not hotshot kids uh, that like ultimately, especially I think in ensemble music, it might be a little bit different in other types of subjects in school where the individual is the one getting the grade all the time. Uh, as opposed to the ensemble setting or the music classroom, but it, it's it, we have a really tough job because we're trying to always thread the needle of challenging the hotshot kid, while also uh, building up the skills of the kid who maybe can't sing sing his way out of a paper bag or can barely hold the instrument or or whatever it is. We have to figure out a way to empower all of those kids uh, to pull up the bottom while not boring the top. Um, you know, the, so it's a, it's a really, uh, it's an interesting thing. Uh, now I, I wonder too, cause this could be another place where we transition. If it's okay, I'd like to switch into a topic that I also see you post about a lot, uh, which is, um, professional development, comp like stuff, like I issues with teachers dealing with bad PDs and, uh, or lots of PDs that don't uh, relate to our job. Uh, so I kind of just a, a second ago, I outlined one of the biggest challenges with our job, which might be different than the challenges of our math colleagues or our science colleagues or, or whatever. And so I've got one here that you that you posted, which was, um, let's see, oh, four types of teacher approved professional development. And so you kind of listed out things that teachers would love to have but rarely do have with our professional development time. So I'll outline those for the listeners. Um, so just time, 
like time in our classrooms to organize, to plan, uh, to make a cute poster, uh, you know, whatever it is that we want to to have as set up as our um, as our environment that we have cultivated for the kids. So that's an important one. Um, musical time, so a, a musical PD. So. Um, maybe maybe this would be like a PD where we're actually learning how to be a better musician in the classroom and or how to cultivate those musicians. Wouldn't that be amazing, especially in public school? Uh, pyramid meetings, so the the chance to meet with our, our colleagues that uh, maybe teach music at the different levels of school. So the elementary school kids, teachers getting to meet with the middle school teachers and then the high schools all together in one space. Um, exper- and having an experienced speaker. Uh, preferably classroom experience, uh, but at least recently, which I found funny. So uh, first, before I kind of share some thoughts about that, why don't you talk again about just like what what was irking you uh, to create that meme? <laughs> well, okay. Well, first, I guess it's that, you know, as a um, previous classroom teacher, I we would sit through so many meetings that had nothing to do with our um, art form and, and with no acknowledgement of us either. Like it'd be one thing if they're like, you know, arts people, specials people, whatever they call, you know, music, art, PE, like take, take a half hour, come back soon. But we would sit through these PDs that were like three, four, five hours long that were about test scores and things that they would barely relate to what we were doing and that were so frustrating. And then even my college students will have to sit through these gen ed classes where people are talking about seating um, and they'll spend classroom management where, uh, where they are, um, they have no idea what we do. And so this, it starts in college. They, they experience this from their freshman year for some of our students in their gen ed classes where they are, Uh, just like a little blip on, you know, the radar of the gen ed people sometimes. And then it continues and it gets worse when they go into the classroom. And so, so many of my friends were talking about sitting through eight hour PDs that didn't have anything to do with them. And I was like, stop. And then people asked me to come do PD and they'll have these specific topics. And there was one that I did where um, they wanted me to do three hours of professional development for these teachers. And I had talked to them beforehand and I knew some of them personally already. And I was like, what do you all need for this PD? And they're like, we are so stressed. Like we just need time. We just need time. And I was like, if I give you time, like, please just don't report me. Don't tell on me. But so I let them go early. And I felt so like, I felt like the kids skipping class, you know, cause I was like, okay, so now like they're just, they're just doing their stuff in their classrooms. And I stayed on campus the rest of the time. Cause I was like, I don't want to like get in trouble for not being there, but they just needed time. And the administrators so often don't recognize that for or they don't respect that, or maybe they have like people above them requiring a certain amount of something. I, I don't really know. But when I get asked to do PD, like I want to do what the teachers need. And if the teachers need time, which is often the case, then I'll do my little thing and then give them time. Um, so sorry, that was a lot, but that's kind of what was going through my head. What are, what about you? What are your PD experiences like? So in my district, um, we, for the very first time in my entire career, are being allowed to do our professional development plan. That's kind of like your yearly portfolio of PD uh, related to teaching music and developing. uh, I think they're, they're calling it the develop developing artistry intelligence. And, and it's, and it's going to be, yeah. And I, I, uh, our shout out to my friend, Amy, who's our music supervisor in the district, who was able to kind of advocate for that and pull, pull some strings to get us to be able to do that. But I'm, you know, I'm 21 years into education. That's the first time that's ever happened. So, like that says yep. something, um, and, yep. and so usually it's this t- the type of PD that you just described, which is you know an entire day. Uh, for example, uh, we have we still have a lot of that in my district, but uh, w- for example, we did almost two solid days prior to the start of school year, uh, just in uh, talking about how to make your classroom a welcoming environment. And I was like, okay, cool, that's important to do. But like we spent two days on this and we didn't talk about how to be better teachers at all. Uh, like we didn't talk about how to be more effective. We didn't learn about how to uh, how to do our jobs better. Uh, there, we just we focused on this this other stuff. And so sometimes what I've noticed is that administrators, it's not I, I don't lay the blame at principal's feet. 
I, I lay the blame at the upper level school district administrator type person who is thinking not, they're not thinking on the, the micro level of what teachers and students that interact with each other need. They're figuring out what types of messages do they want to send to the public. Because the PD, the PDs that they purchase, they, they pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for these in some cases, um, are, uh, are, they are, those are calling cards for those administrators to say, look, look at how much we care about our students belonging. We did two whole days on, on that. And, and, but then nobody thinks about like, yeah, the kids do need to belong, but do they need their teachers to, to lose two days of their preparatory time? What's really best for students, uh, you know, in that scenario, nobody really asks those types of questions. So that, that's been kind of my uh, experience with this. And I get asked to do a lot of PDs around the country as well. Um, and I, I, I tend to get similar reactions of that, that, you know, we need, uh, we need a chance to just learn. In, in my case, I typically get asked by groups of teachers who don't feel like they know in, uh, well, I think from, in my particular case, I get a lot of, I don't know how to teach kids to read music because that's kind of what I'm known for. Uh, like nobody, nobody taught me how to do this. And so they, they asked me to come and teach them because they're stressed about how much extra time it's taking them to teach their their content because they they've never been taught how to do it effectively, and so then my I will show up and try to help them be better and quicker and more efficient with how they're teaching their content so that they have more time down down the road to do other types of things if that makes sense. So I think we're we're kind of both sniffing up two sides of the same tree here. Yeah. Uh, oh my gosh, for sure. Well, and it's it's so refreshing to see that more and more districts are are not only bringing like local music teachers from other counties, you know, to their professional development, but that they're hiring people from across the country, that they're investing those funds to actually, you know, pour into their music teachers. Because I, I believe so firmly that a significant part of teacher burnout is that just... Um, apathy and and I'm sorry like disrespect to not appreciate where they're coming from in um in especially our specials as you know our electives teachers uh so it's been really exciting to see like that's another landscape that I do see changing but I think that part of that is that people are more and more bold to kind of call out the issues that have been happening in education and I think that that needs to continue to happen because if it doesn't then, you know, they're just going to go back to being lazy and doing their networking. That's the other thing is that so often it's like, oh, who do I already know that I need a favor from? Let me invite them out here. Let me let me work with their company to bring them out. So mm -hmm. it's it's really cool to see that shifting um, in time. And hopefully that'll continue. And then the availability to a virtual professional development. Like I know some of my former students who are super rural communities, they now are allowed to do like a virtual PD and and instead of attending their own districts, which has been really wonderful. I mean, have, there's some kind of balance. I don't know what it is, but there's some kind of balance where they can spend a certain amount of hours doing like a virtual PD. And so that way they can, even though they're in, you know, very rural community, they can access some really high quality, applicable music professional development. And that's been, that's been really amazing to see. Yeah, it's a, it is very. I agree. I've seen that change in the last few years as well, and I think it's also could be connected to more more of us kind of going out there and and putting professional development out online. It's wet. It's almost like it's wetting the appetite for more because people didn't realize that there were all these great resources out there, um, and so more and more people are starting to put them online, and then and then saying, hey, yeah, there is so much more to learn that I didn't learn in undergrad. Um, and nobody taught me and that's not my undergrad's fault. It's just that they, you know, there's only so many things. And then I get out into the profession and I realize that, Hey, actually I would love it if I was way better at this job. And, <laughs> and honestly, I wish more educators would kind of take that approach, uh, and not just music educators, which is that like, if your ethos is not, is it's not about beating yourself up and saying, I suck at this. It's about saying, I really want to get better at this. And, and if I can be, you know, 21 years into teaching and still really believe that I, I, my best years of teaching are still ahead of me, then there is no reason that somebody five years in can't also think that. In fact, you probably should. I, I hope you're not at your best at five years in, you know. Um, so that, that I think that's, that's a partly that with things that I've noticed that are really exciting about uh, kind of about what's going on. Yes. And speaking of all of that, 
I want you to talk about the rehearsals. Tell, tell us about putting rehearsals yeah. online for us to actually see and, and you know, um, digest. Like, how cool is this? Yeah. So recently on my TikTok and on my Instagram reels, and I, I post these rehearsal clips and I'm going to be making more, um, but they've been really successful and have been driving a lot of engagement to my pages. But um, I, the, the the origin story for that is is kind of embarrassing. But essentially, I, uh, I have two uh, people who work for me that run my social media. Uh, through through Coralosophy. So all the Instagram posts are, are Anna, who's incredible. She does all the Instagram posts and uh, this awesome high school kid named Isaac, shout out to Isaac, um, does all of my, my video clips. And th they both over the years have made comments to me about how I should probably be doing more of that stuff, like putting, because they, they, they're online a lot and they see that those are the types of things that get engagement. And so other, other listeners have been asking, like, I, you, I hear you talking about all these pedagogical things on the show, but I, I really would like to see it because it's hard for me to visualize. And so I've been getting requests for this for years. I've just been dragging my feet, like partly just because it's hard, it's hard, it's harder. Like I have to do more editing and like more, more clipping and all those types of things. And so recently this school year, I told the kids at school um, who like to kind of make fun of me when I record things at school. Uh, but I said, I, guys, I'm going to start recording more of rehearsals so that uh, so that people around the country can see what it is that we do. And uh, and we, they just like, OK, that's fine. And so we just d jumped into it. Uh, so if you want to go and check that out, uh, basically, they're just opportunities to peek into my choir rehearsal. Uh, so far, I've done it with my advanced group because they're the, the bravest to be like to have the camera running. Uh, but as the school year goes along, I plan to also go in with my beginning level groups and intermediate level groups. So it's not just, you know, my fancy choir kids. Um, but, and so people can see like the, the full scope of things. I love that. Like I would love to see so much more of that from other teachers, just from, from teachers, because I think that if people could see the way real rehearsals were run, not the way like we idealize them, you know, the real issues that come up and how um, an experienced teacher handles those, I think that that would just kind of, you know, move our needle so far along. Have you found that like, as you've been doing that, that you've improved a lot as an educator? Because I feel like as you know, the more I watch myself, the more I'm like, oh, I better do this different or whatever. Have you kind of had a little bit more of that? I mean, I'm kind of curious how that's felt. Yeah, I would say so. I, I would say there are definitely, I, of course, I'm now um, a, a, a pretty seasoned of like at just recording myself in general. Uh, just through the podcast and other types of things. So I've, I've kind of gotten into a routine of as I edit things, whether it be, you know, podcast clips or, uh, or a lesson online or whatever it is, uh, that I'm always just listen. I'm in the habit of listening and going, I wish I had said that differently. And uh, it almost like, you know, how normal people who don't have online platforms uh, would maybe talk out loud to themselves in their cars as they drive to work or whatever it is, so to, like to hear yourself talk and then, and then kind of edit your thoughts in that way. Uh, I know a lot of people do that. Uh, for me, I, I, I just, I do that through the, through the podcast. So I edit my thinking almost by listening back and thinking, oh, I, had, I said that on a, on a show. Um, I, I kind of wish I had not said that. Or, uh, or I just said that to my class in a way that I wish that I had not said it or, you know, whatever else it is. And so then I just make little tweaks as I go. I, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, and I know a lot of my listeners are like early career music teachers. So for all of you, please record yourself. It is the best thing you can do. Record your, your rehearsals. It doesn't even have to be video all of the time. Just mm -hmm. listen to your group. Even you'll hear things you never realized were happening um, from all over the ensemble. It is eye opening. And don't like, I feel like in college, we do a ton of that and then we stop. So yeah. some of the best professional de development you can do for yourself is literally just record yourself and listen to it. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, back in the dark ages when I was an undergrad and we had, you know, the VHS cameras and, um, and I had a recording assignment that I was supposed to record myself doing a lesson with a high school choir. It was like during a practicum in undergrad. And I was supposed to take that video to a, a trusted mentor and plug in the tape and play, uh, play the video for, for the mentor. And I chose to take the video to my high school choir teacher um, and show did, did him. Say again. Did you have to sit and watch it with them? Yes. Yes. 
See, that's okay. That's stressful. Okay. Sorry. It, it I was. had to ask. Yes. It was Keep going. Yeah. Um, and so of course I, I filmed myself teaching a, a choir rehearsal and I took it to him. And of course I'm expecting to get like this glowing review from him about how proud he is of me. And I've come so far since high school and like all these things. And, and, uh, and, and when the video was done, um, he just looked at me and he's like, that was really boring, Chris. I, I was, it was like watching paint dry. And, and he said, and I was like crushed and he goes, well, I only say that because like, I know you, like I know the real you. And that was not the real you. That was like you in like some taking on some fake lecturer person persona that like, it was almost like you were trying to impress the kids. And I was like, well, yeah, I guess I kind of was. And, and he said, well, okay, so this is, this is going to be something you'll have to work on because the kids will be bored too. It, you like you you're funny you make really like goofy jokes and you have this goofy personality you know let your kids see that because you can do all the impressive music stuff and that like you, you it, it it has to be engaging and so he gave me that first bit of invi- advice that came from a recording uh, of myself and it was it it shaped me after that I, it took me like i said 5 or 6 years to actually do that because it was easier said than done but, uh, but I, I, that haunted me for those, those years. Like I've got to figure out a way to be myself. And, and I, I will say it kind of ties back to the, well, one of the things we were talking about before, I will say though, that it was improvement in my musical skill that, that ultimately allowed me to be not stressed enough or too, not too stressed to be myself. And I, I don't know if that makes sense, but like when I became better at reading, reading the score, preparing the score, um, being on top of my conducting gesture, um, being being ready to master a rehearsal, then I was walking into the rehearsal with less stress, and and it was the stress that was stamping out my true personality. It wasn't that I didn't want to be myself. It was that I was so worried about getting notes and rhythms wrong, or or not being able to hear what was going on in the in the rehearsal that I wasn't able to show my true self because I was wrapped up in musical struggle. And so it was it was me being a better musician that freed myself up to do that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I just am thinking of like my first time conducting grade six music, you know, or like my first time conducting a full orchestra rehearsal. Mm -hmm. It was so stressful. I mean, I felt like I still look back and think I was like in a box and that's obviously that's not my personality at all, but you know, I think you're right. And as teachers, like conducting those rehearsals, those really challenging ones, that we sometimes almost dread because they're so hard and we're so insecure. They're so humbling, but those can be some of the best parts of our musicianship development, right? Like um, also side note, I am totally stealing that lesson. My Ammerman students, you guys are all getting this lesson where you have to record yourself and take it to a mentor teacher and watch it with them. I love that. Sorry. I had to rewind yeah. that. No, that's good. That yeah, so it, it was, it's a good yeah, assignment because so it really good. forces you yes. to, forces so you to put yourself out there um, in the same way that sing, like we train singers and players to, to go, to, to go be singers and players. They have to put themselves out there in front of an audience. You know, we might as well learn to empathize <laughs> with that. I think that's exactly. important. Yeah. Now, Angela, yeah. this has been lots of fun. I, th- I say we wrap this up. It's been about an hour. Um, but le- on our way out, let's, let's, uh, I would like you to share with the Coralosophy folks, um, where do we go find your podcast and, and how, what is, uh, uh, what are, what are some of the things we would find on your podcast? Yes. Um, so you can find my podcast. It's hashtag music ed love. It is, it runs the gamut. Honestly, it's like whatever I'm interested in at the time. Um, But I've got some phenomenal speakers on there that I just really love. And you'll hear things about like teaching babies music all the way to teaching an 84 year old woman. Um, And so it really truly runs the gamut. And I absolutely love it. And also, if you all get a chance to check out the Music Teacher's Guide to Recruitment and Retention and the Music Teacher's Guide to Engaging English Language Learners, I would love that. Those are my two books that are currently out. And the one on classroom management is on its way, which is super exciting. But you can also find me at Music Teacher's Guide on Instagram. And Chris, will you share with us same thing, anything we should check out and um, where we can find your podcast and your Instagram. Yeah, uh, Coralosophy Podcast, uh, and that's choral, like choral music, and then philosophy, like philo- the the philosophy part, um, which my my business business oriented father 
uh, was really frustrated when I came up with the name because he said, I'm going to have to explain it. You, you need a catchier name. Um, but uh, it's, it is Coralosophy Podcast, and you can find it on any podcast player. You can find it on YouTube. Um, you can find it now on TikTok, as we mentioned before, and of course the Instagram, Facebook, pretty much everywhere. I'm very easy to find, and I really love talking about music education philosophy, whether it's on the podcast or on social media. Uh, so feel free to hit, hit me up, ask questions, and be part of the conversation. Yay! Thank you so much, Chris. This was awesome. I had such a great time talking with you tonight. You too. Thank you, as always, for sticking around to the end of an episode. I really enjoyed that conversation. I hope you found something valuable and something useful. Or sometimes you just like to be a fly on the wall, as I speak with folks here on the show. Regardless of what keeps you around to the end, I really appreciate you listening all the way to the end. If you are still with me, that means you might be willing to help. Leave comments, leave ratings, subscribe to everything you can subscribe to, um, uh, leave comments, have conversations. All these things help other people see the show. And then, of course, you can use that Coralosophy checkout code at Endeavor Music Publishing, Graphite Music Pub- GraphitePublishing.com, SightReadingFactory.com, and MyMusicFolders.com. Thanks, everybody. We will see you next time.